So good morning, everyone here in Brazil and good afternoon for the ones in Netherlands and in Europe, I'm not sure. And this lecture is number eight, that's our research group, Sanitation and Recovery, uh, Resource Recovery is Organizing. So we have invited researchers and professors who work with wastewater treatment field, especially to talk about nutrient removal and resource recovery. And all these lectures can be seen in our YouTube channel after I'm gonna write down in the chat the link. And today is our last but not least, as we say, uh, lecture of 2020. In fact, he, uh, he's a really special guest and he will talk about sanitary engineering at TU Delft. Oriented Research Lines on Wastewater Treatment. Well, he's a full professor in wastewater treatment and environmental engineering at Delft University of Technology. He received his P MSc and PhD degrees from Wageningen University in the in Netherlands. And he's specialized in anaerobic treatment technology. He published over 250 scientific papers and book chapters. And he has also chaired the IWA Anaerobic Digestion Specialist Group between 2001 and 2009, and became nominated member of the IWA Fellow Program in 2011. So he's Professor Jules Bonnier from TU Delft. So Jules, it's a great pleasure to have you as our online guest today. Thank you for accepting the invitation. And I will let, not the floor for your, for you, but the screen, let's see. So the screen is yours. Thank you again. And okay, you can. Okay, thank you very much for your uh, nice introduction, Luana. And uh, okay, and with this presentation, I uh, would like to say a nice good morning to all of you. Here we're almost ending the day, but we have some time to go and I would like to share this hour with you to discuss a bit more what we're doing in Delft uh, on the topics that Luana was mentioning. Um, and uh, now here you see some pictures of Delft, the inner city of Delft, the old town was never destroyed by a war, so it has this still the character of a 17th century uh, Dutch typical city with a lot of canals. And below you see the Faculty of Civil Engineering where I'm working. Uh, Delft University, for those who don't know, this is by the way is the Netherlands, it's uh, not a very big country. So we have about uh, 400 kilometer of length and 200 kilometer of width. And we uh, live about 17, 18 million people. So not, it's quite densely populated, but not too populated. It's not one big city, but uh, it's quite, uh, quite uh, yeah, dense, but uh, still livable, I would say. Um, we have a landscape. We have only have, uh, we don't have private universities in the Netherlands. We only have um, governmental universities. And uh, we have uh, four technical universities in the Netherlands and the University of Delft is the biggest. And next to Delft, we have Twente, uh, Wageningen University and Eindhoven University. And uh, the other uh, universities marked with yellow, these are the, uh, the, the general universities. They have also humanities, medicines, uh, languages, etc. cetera. Uh, these are all numbers of students and uh, current numbers, uh, at least in Delft that I know, is uh, 25,000 uh, MSc students and about 5,000 PhD students. Um, now, just to explain a little bit from Delft how we are constructed, we have uh, the university is divided in, in, in faculties, uh, only technology. Uh, we have one faculty is technology and policy management, as, uh, it's not hard engineering, and the rest is everything is dedicated to uh, science and engineering and technologies. Um, so, uh, we are in the faculty of civil engineering, now here we work with water and wastewater treatment. And there's another faculty where water and wastewater treatment is dealt with. And that's the, uh, the, the faculty is applied science. Maybe you know my colleague, uh, Mark van Loosdijk, he's a world famous professor. And he's working in the, um, the uh, faculty of applied science, but we have some cooperative projects together. And we try to uh, 
not to compete each other, but to complement each other. And so far that works pretty well. Our faculty of civil engineering, and uh, we are, uh, yeah, the, the diehard civil engineers are there, uh, scientists are there, transport, but also department of water, hydraulic engineering is there, coastal defense, name it, but also water management and inside the department of water management, we are embedded. We are the uh, section of sanitary engineering. And this section I, I'm heading, so I'm head of the section sanitary engineering, and my profession is wastewater treatment technology and environmental engineering. I'm my colleague, Luc Rietveld, he's professor of uh, drinking water engineering, and he's the head of the department to which this section belongs. And for the rest, uh, you see the number of uh, staff that we have in total. We have about uh, 15 people of staff and about 50 to 60 PhD students working in the different fields of the water cycle. Um, now, what is our research about? Well, uh, in our research program, we couple everything that has to do with water treatment and water extraction and water division, water conveyance inside the urban area. So fresh water extraction, subterranean, also surface water extraction to make it up for drinking water. So drinking, uh, in, uh, drinking water, the, uh, the conveyance in drinking water networks and network stability. Uh, we have 100% connection of uh, households to the network, uh, household activities then use the water, then the wasted water is conveyed. Uh, I think that 99% of the households are connected to the sewage system and 1% remote areas, remote farmers, they have their own um, treatment, they are disconnected. Now in the sewage is connected to treatment systems where the waste is separated from the water and the treated water is then going back to, to nature. In addition to municipal wastewater treatment and domestic wastewater treatment, we're also dealing with industry water, where we have to focus on, uh, on water intensive industries. We uh, uh, actively research water use and water reuse, process water quality, process water characteristics, treatment techniques to treat industrial water, recycling, reuse and recovery, and the um, nexus water and energy is being studied. If you then go back to uh, the past decades, let's so to say, then the research in the water chain changed a bit and we now are more focusing on water recycling. And uh, that entails uh, not the recycling only of water, but also from the resources. So the municipal wastewater treatment plant is more and more regarded as a resource factory. And uh, now in the Netherlands, uh, a lot of research has been done and it is now lifted to implementation level for various resources that are, that are extracted from the sewage line. Now you have to think on the phosphorus that is recovered on commercial scale and recycled. Uh, fibers are recovered at commercial scale and recycled for road constructions. Um, uh, and energy, of course, is also recovered. And other uh, elements, are uh, now uh, ammonium as well is being uh, recovered. We have some research on that that will be presented later. Now the treated water, um, that so far is uh, was going to nature also a direct coupling is being made uh, to make this water usable for consumers and the consumers are in the Netherlands the industry is the biggest water consumer uh, so they use also effluence of treatment plants and in addition to the industry also agriculture and particularly uh, the, uh, the greenhouses, no, not not the, uh, the the open agriculture because we are a rain fat country, but the greenhouses they 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 need uh, 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 water for uh, now the hydroponic system. So in that sense, uh, now there's quite some knowledge built up. Uh, in fact, what we do is water technology, water treatment from the most dirtiest water that you can think of, up to ultra pure water, which is cleaner than drinking water to be used in, in industry for uh, industrial purposes. Um, a little bit, some slides about education and then we come to the research back again. So uh, we are part of the faculty of MS, of the civil engineering. So our MSc um, trajectory is the MSc of civil engineering with the track of water management and the specialization of sanitary uh, engineering. That is the current situation, however, we are now, just at this moment, we are revising our uh, curriculum. And as per uh, September 22, we will launch the new MSCs in our faculty. We will have three MSCs. And one MSC will be 
on environmental engineering and next to civil engineering and next to earth uh, of uh, applied, applied earth science, I believe. Anyway, the, the, the new MSc of uh, environmental engineering will consist of three tracks. Uh, the one, the biggest one will be water engineering in which we will be uh, embedded as well as water technology for drinking water, wastewater, industry water, but also that will entail urban water engineering of sewerage, pipe networks, drainage, etc., and uh, hydrology, and it is uh, urban hydrology, but also the larger water cycle, groundwater, and, 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 and water resources. Now, the other tracks that will entail uh, waste resource engineering for solid wastes, plastics, etc., and uh, an, another track is atmosphere and, and environment. Um, now, uh, another slide on, uh, on online and campus. Uh, most of our uh, education is campus education, but we, are, we were already investing since 2013 on uh, internet education. Uh, now, now COVID, now we're quite happy because a lot of our education was already online. And we accelerate, in fact, this development at this moment to make more and more online. So you can find our courses uh, in um, massive open online uh, uh, courses or uh, MOOCs. We are part of the edX platform. And on this slide, you can see there on top um, the, uh, the uh, edX um, uh, site, the website of edX. Now, these, these are free courses. Um, in addition, uh, we make also open courseware, so all our lectures you can be can be followed online without paying. But we have also some online distance education, and then you have to pick pay because that is coupled on doing exams. Now and uh, now, recently we also um, investing in professional education courses. So um, then also people from outside as well as our own MSc students can follow these courses. These are topic-wise addressed and available via internet, which includes also examination and testing, etc. At this moment, uh, as our group, we develop three courses. Courses Two are already online and, and, and can be followed. One is on membrane technology and one is on aerobic granular sludge technology. The third one that I'm responsible, I'm a bit, I'm a bit lazy, and didn't managed to get it finished this year, but I hope to do it next year, is on high rate anaerobic treatment. Um, now, these water, uh, yeah, we have quite a lot of students. The 30,000 is already an old number, but I guess we passed now uh, 100,000 students following our, our MOOC. So with internet, you can address a lot, a lot of people, and that uh, is quite convenient. So in that sense, internet is liberalizing knowledge, as we say. Okay, what I would like to share with you is the research lines that we have in our uh, section and we'll focus uh, later on on the wastewater treatment uh, research. Um, as mentioned, we uh, can divide roughly in four uh, target areas. Uh, one is drinking water and that group is uh, particularly focusing on the extraction, surface water and groundwater. About uh, um, two-thirds of the Netherlands is drinking groundwater of uh, very old groundwater of 10,000 years ago the ice age but one third particularly the west is drinking surface water it's coming from the river Rhine and from the river Meuse. now these are uh, quite pollutant and so we have extensive treatment before uh, the water is uh, supplied to the drinking water net uh, particularly for in our case as the netherlands is not using any chlorine anymore since the end of the 90s um, and that might sound Peculiar, uh, also in the United States, they don't understand what that we don't chlorinate. The reason for it is that we would like to avoid the, um, the use of um, a chlorine to prevent the formation of carcinogenic methanochlorides or organochlorides, and because the network always has some organics uh, somewhere, some biofilms or whatsoever. But if you oxidize that with chlorine, you form a carcinogenic organochlorides, and that is what we don't want. So disinfection is completed with UV and ozone peroxide. And that is a, a yeah, large part of the research what to do. But uh, linked to that, uh, research on micropollutants is uh, being done, and the treatment of micropollutants, also the um, to, uh, to analyze the micropollutants, um, uh, treatment, compact treatment, extensive treatment, you name it, um, that is being done and that is quite useful because at this moment, linked to uh, wastewater treatment, we are also interested in micropollutants as a, as a kind of a quaternary step, as a final step 
for uh, before the wastewater is being uh, upgraded for for reuse and also micropollutants need to be uh, treated so we can use that knowledge that was built up in the drinking water um, engineering for for wastewater engineering as well what type of technologies advanced technologies membrane disinfection um, is being used but we also have quite some uh, you know, work done in developing countries, uh, particularly on arsenic removal. As one of our uh, colleagues is uh, specialized in that. Um, as large parts in the world have arsenic in, in groundwater and we're looking for cost effective measures to get rid of these arsenic. Our group on urban drainage that is uh, enlarged in the past uh, few years, uh, they are dealing with asset management, uh, risk assessment, failure mechanism, probabilistic modeling, inspection techniques, and novel sanitation systems. So everything that has to do with urban drainage, sewage systems, uh, pipe networks is dealt with, with this group. And um, now at this moment, we uh, have the, particularly a focal point on uh, cybersecurity and artificial intelligence. So uh, this is all um, yeah, high-tech uh, um, sensor uh, uh, with sensor equipped uh, uh, systems but they are vulnerable for uh, internet attacks and in fact that we realize now now uh, we intensify the internet in such a way that we also realize more and more how fragile we are and how susceptible these systems are for cyber attacks so cyber security is now a very uh, yeah, big focal point for particularly these large infrastructures that should be yeah, completely safe for any attack from outside. In the wastewater treatment, uh, we have two types of focal points. One is the municipal wastewater, and the other focal point is the industry water. Within municipal wastewater, we focus on aerobic granular sludge, and that's a technology which is slowly is replacing the conventional activated sludge reactors, um, aerobic granular sludge technology we cooperate with industries. So Royal House Corning DHV is uh, one of the uh, is the main um, in fact partner. Um, they're selling these uh, reactors under the name Nereda. Maybe you heard of that. And uh, now slowly, also in the Netherlands, you see that Nereda is is is, is replacing conventional activated sludge simply because it's way cheaper. Seventy percent of um, of of the space, and since you don't need clarifiers anymore and uh, you have also 50 percent less energy use 30 to 50 percent less energy use we will come back later because we have some ongoing research on uh, on uh, this type of granular sludge as well emerging pollutants what i just mentioned was already studied for drinking water but it's now studied uh, for effluent uh, use uh, of effluent reuse and water reuse of treated effluent we uh, did in the past quite some research on aerobic membrane bioreactors. At this moment, we're doing some research on anaerobic membrane bioreactors. Um, we work on anaerobic control systems, uh, resource recovery, uh, P and N, phosphorus and nitrogen are standing here, but also other um, resources are being recovered. Energy efficiency is, uh, is, uh, is a must. And uh, coupled to that, we do quite some research on enhanced digestion of the excess sludge. I will come back to that later. With respect to industry water, which is more high strength and which can also be very toxic, think about uh, chemical wastewaters uh, that need to be treated. We developed an anaerobic membrane bioreactor system for that. Um, uh, treated municipal water as process water is being researched, but also going to ultra pure water and boiler feed water and the physical chemical stability of the water. We have some large European projects. Some, uh, one project is called Zero Brine, for instance, where reverse osmosis brines are upgraded in that sense that uh, the salts are recovered for, to make vendable products of the salts coming from the brine of reverse osmosis. And reverse osmosis is uh, used to upgrade the treated water to generate, again, process water from the same water. Now, particularly in water scarce areas, that could be an interesting technique to, to, be, uh, to be done. Um, now, the actual research uh, here at the website is given from, uh, for our, our project. Uh, there's an overview of the research project. You can click on the staff member, on the different staff members, and then you see the actual research. What I would like to do in this, the remainder of this presentation, I selected seven topics in which we have current PhD research lines. Uh, also, all sites 
these typical uh, research line, of course, we have interest also to step in other type of research if that is linked to industrial wastewater or uh, municipal wastewater. So um, one important point is to maximize the energy potential of excess sewage sludge. That is of importance because our government is in fact um, giving incentives for joint projects together with the industry and the water authorities to minimize fossil fuel consumption in municipal sewage treatment plants. And excess sludge is one of the topics, uh, one of these uh, yeah, where you can extract the biochemical energy and turn it into a useful energy carrier. As mentioned, anaerobic membrane bioreactors we work. Uh, we work on bulk chemicals production from wastewater components and recovery from concentrated streams, sanitation in constrained areas, and that is meant as a developing country cooperation uh, in Bangladesh and in India and in Africa. Water reuse, the use of treated sewage and irrigated agriculture, we do some research in that, and uh, Nareda uh, technology. Now let's go uh, through these topics a little bit more in detail to these seven topics. Here you see um, the maximization of the energy potential of excess sludge. At this moment, we have uh, five PhD students working on this topic. And I will give some, some results of these uh, PhD students. First, uh, enzymatic sludge pretreatment, use of aquatic worms. Then we do hydrodynamic modeling of sludge digesters using uh, uh, computational fluid dynamics with the idea to optimize the mixing in digesters to have a higher efficiency of uh, digestive systems. We have some research being done on the plug flow system, cascading uh, CSTR systems, and uh, other researchers doing mild pretreatment on uh, for enhancing hydrolysis. And we research the impact of um, uh, uh, um, pressure, uh, thermal pressure hydrolysis like with the Campi system, these are um, systems, the pre hydrolyze the sludge before digesting, and they use high pressure and high temperature to crack the sludge, to solubilize the sludge, so more energy comes free during digesting. Now, these, these such uh, research lines, they don't, uh, they're not simply created, but we always work together with companies. Uh, we, we, we never do sludge only by ourselves. Uh, we, we don't have money as a university. The only way to generate research money is, is to apply for projects. And in the Netherlands, the situation is that you can only get money when companies are involved. So you have to work always to, with companies in order to secure funds from the government. Um, that is on one hand, that might be a hassle because you have to actually hunt for these projects. But for the other side, we like that because we are, have a direct contact with the market, uh, we can listen very carefully to the market to, to listen to the needs of the market and so that the technology that you develop is quickly implemented by the market. And the patents that you can get, uh, the, the, the uh, intellectual property rights, you can share either uh, with the, the, the people with the market or sometimes we also keep them for ourselves and then later on sell the patents to, 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 uh, to the companies. And that way you can also generate some, some, some flux of money. Now I will give some, some examples of this work, what we do with digesters. Uh, well, what is sewage sludge? Uh, for the, those who are working with sewage sludge, uh, well, it is not just bacteria. The, the mass of, of living bacteria in excess sewage sludge is in fact very little. And that is a misunderstanding that sometimes people have. But if you analyze the sludge very well, you see that only 10, 15% of the excess sewage sludge, at least from the samples that we studied here in the Netherlands, consists of living bacteria. And the rest are other compounds. And then you have to think of, uh, well, of course, there are some higher organisms, grazing, some ciliates, etc., uh, carbohydrates, but most of it is proteins. And most of the proteins are there as extracellular pro proteins in the EPS of, of, of the sludge mass. Uh, lipids are there, DNA, RNA is there, unit matter is there. Well, you find everything in there, fractions, clay, precipitates, heavy metals, uh, organic micropollutants, plastics, and you name it. Um, one of our students, uh, um, Adrian Gonzalez, he published a, a paper about the pretreatment of sewage sludge, and he did this characterization of the sludge uh, in, in the Netherlands. And you can Google that in, in, on, uh, in, the, in, in the web. But we need this knowledge 
uh, this inside knowledge is needed to develop technology to address a specific fraction of the sludge. Once you know what is the composition of the sludge, then you can think about how um, to develop a pretreatment technology or treatment technology to either uh, disrupt that compound or maybe recover a certain compound. In one of the researches that we do, we use, for instance, uh, we digested sludge and we, we, we saw that if you combine uh, aquatic worms uh, eating the sludge and then digested sludge, you will have a much higher uh, degradation of uh, volatile suspended solids uh, here expressed and days and, and, and the presences of reduction than when you only use digestion. So apparently these worms, they do something. Now, later on, this is Steve DeVolk, he will get his PhD this year. He researched further the intestinal tract of the worms and he found that the, particularly the proteins, they are targets. So the worms in the intestinal tract of the worms, there are a lot of proteases. And that, uh, that the, the proteases are not excreted by the worms themselves, but he also found out and he published that, that is the microflora, the bacteria, which are in fact hosted inside the gut of the worms, they produce the proteases, degrading the proteins of the excess sludge. Now we know that the largest fractions of excess sludge were proteins, and then, now we understand why, why these aquatic worms are so effective in, uh, in, in enhancing the digestibility of, um, of the degradation of, of the excess sludge. So his, he observed the increased conversion of polypeptides in the EPS and the active bacteria-based proteinases in the worm intestinal tract. Now, what you can do with this knowledge is that you know, using worms is one option, but uh, the uh, water authorities, they don't like to work with this uh, metazoa. This is too much of a hassle. But once you know that the proteases is, are very effective, uh, some of these water authorities are now interested in using uh, proteases cocktails to enhance the uh, digestion of excess uh, sewage sludge. But later on, we also use this insight to develop a complete novel technology without using external enzymes, but creating uh, the enzymes ourselves in, within the technology. But I will come back to that later. This is uh, Peng Wei, and he is, uh, uh, yeah, he is a hydraulic uh, specialist. He's uh, using computational fluid dynamics to characterize the sludge inside the digester. And he found all kinds of an anomalies that we didn't know before um, he studied all sludge Rio Grande, and now he's making a hydrodynamic model of a digester, taking these anomalies of, uh, of sludge into account. I will not go into too much in the details of CFD modeling, but uh, yeah, what's very strange is that uh, yeah, if you, at the low shear rates, is it has a huge impact, the changing of the uh, shear rate um, has a huge impact on, on, on the viscosity of sludge. However, in the very low shear rates, then the sludge is, uh, yeah, is in fact not moving. That means the, in the digester, there is little turbulence. And that means under these little turbulence conditions, the energy input that you require for sludge mixing is in fact higher than you would expect based on normal viscosity relations um, uh, and, and, uh, that are now occur, of, no, that are known in, in literature based on simply energy input. Um, also, Peng is finishing his thesis and I hope too that he will get it uh, done by this year. But computational fluid dynamics, uh, this is a skill that you, uh, that you do not learn within a year. Right? That takes quite some time before you learn that. But uh, yeah, if uh, people are interested, of course, we will proceed with that. Um, this is another PhD student, this is Hongshu Guo. He's uh, also finishing off. Uh, he is studying the digestibility of aerobic granular sludge in comparison to waste activated sludge. Um, we already know that aerobic granular sludge from these narrator reactors, that 15 to 20 percent of the of the weight of the dry weight consists of alginate-like uh, polymers, alginate-like compounds, and these uh, these compounds they are very rigid. Um, that was discovered a couple of years ago. Based on that, there's now a new industry uh, is made, is that the, who is extracting these alginate-like compounds from that granular sludge. 
Um, and that is, uh, uh, they, they call that resource, this new resource from Access Slush, they call that Kaumera, K-A-U-M-E-R-A, -E Kaumera. So if you Google that, then you will find the, uh, uh, the, the products that they made from this material. But that means, in fact, that a waste product is now turned into a valuable resource, which was before not there. And Calmera is now uh, yeah, being tested uh, as coating material, for instance, for asphalt, but also coating material for paper, and, uh, which is a non-edible uh, application. And if something is non-edible, then the success for this new resource is pretty high. But it also means if you can make money from this excess sludge, then, uh, then there's a, an other incentive to go for wastewater treatment, uh, not only to treat the water, but also to make this product. Now, uh, Guo, he, he researched a bit uh, about the characteristics, because when do you extract this, uh, before digestion or after digestion? He found out uh, that, uh, now here you see the, uh, the degradation of uh, structural exopolymeric substances in granular sludge and a waste activated sludge. And he found out that is that is uh, granular sludge, that the uh, extra polymer substance are far more rigid in comparison to waste activated sludge. Also during digestion, only part of these of these extra uh, uh, cellular polymers they were degraded. That means that you can first digest excess aerobic granular sludge, and from the digest state you can still extract the polymers that are used for making that Calmera, that new resource coming from this. Now this is quite important to know because then the raw sludge can be first treated at the treatment site and then the digestate can be used to extract these, uh, this excess polymers from. Of course you can also directly use that but then yeah, yeah it's more truck transport because when you first digest then most of the uh, uh, non-usable uh, excess, uh, uh, non-usable uh, organics are methanized for, for energy purposes. In, uh, in the rest of his study, uh, Gaul was studying the, the degradation of waste activated sludge. And um, the knowledge that we build up of the fact that excess sludge most consists of proteins, so you need proteases to degrade the structural features of uh, excess sludge, we thought, okay, you can add simply the proteases to a digester, but you can also uh, change the profile of your digester and change, uh, in, the, in, the, in fact, the configuration. So we, what we did is we, we, we split a digester in four digesters and we make a cascade of digesters. In this case, uh, you see uh, in the top part of this figure, three uh, digesters in series. Uh, that have uh, each have 10% of the total volume. And then you see a larger reactor at the end. This is a methanogenic reactor. So these first three reactors are very highly loaded. The high loading conditions, and that is what we observed from earlier work, more enzymes are produced by the sludge themselves to degrade the solids. In the reference reactor, you see below, that's a normal CSTR having the same volume as the total volume of the cascade reactor. The specific loading rate of solids in the reference re reactor is, is low. So also the induction of enzymes is low. And thus also the conversion rate of solids is lower, much lower than in the first reactor of the cascade reactor. That was a hypothesis. And uh, now we now uploaded a, a, a new research paper with these results. And uh, what you see here is uh, the small reactors, R1, R2, and R3 are small reactors. Uh, R4 uh, is, the, is the bigger reactor, and, and, and the reference reactor is more or less the same as the R4. Now, what you see also is that we could reduce the loading rate of the cascade reactor, and it still performed excellent, much better than the single-stage reactor. But what you also see is that the hydrolysis rate is, is, is quite higher, it's uh, affected too higher compared to the reference reactor. Now later on we research also to the level of enzymes and what you see here is the prevailing enzymatic rates. The lower part is the proteases and the cellulases and the of the membrane bound, uh, membrane -bound enzymes. In the top two figures these are the free enzymatic 
rates, so of the, of the enzymes that are swimming free in the liquid. Now, in the first instance, you see that much more of the enzymes are bound to the sludge and not so much free uh, swimming enzymes. And what you also uh, can see is that at, 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 at the very low retention times, the small reactors R1, R2, and R3 have the highest enzymatic activity. Now, this, this finding is very important. Uh, we cooperate also with Ryan Horskorn and DHV in developing a novel uh, uh, digestion system, which is now called EFIRA, which is a kind of a plug flow system consisting of several compartments in which a much higher degree of solids conversion is attained in a much shorter time. And the average digested time in the Netherlands are about 20, 25 days, or maybe up to 30 days. But with these systems, you can go up to, of down to, to, to 10, 12 days. Okay, now we switch completely the topic. Keep your questions, uh, remind your questions. You can put them also in the chat and after my presentation, we can come back to the questions. Um, now this is a completely different topic and that is uh, anaerobic membrane bioreactors. There's a bit of a hobby that I'm working on already for uh, maybe 15 years. Um, and it is particularly to uh, expand the application potentials of anaerobic technology. Uh, particularly for extreme conditions, uh, chemical wastewaters that are difficult to treat with uh, the normal sludge bed reactors, uh, low temperature, high salinity, high temperature, etc. Now we have four PhD students working on this, uh, Julian Munoz uh, finishing off the thesis, Victor Garcia also writing, then Alejandra Zabo and Magella Odrio Sola. Indeed, all Latin American colleagues. Julian from Colombia, Victor from Mexico, and Alejandra Magella coming from Uruguay. Uruguayos. And let me see, for instance, this is some result of, uh, of uh, Julian Munoz. Um, he compared uh, USB reactors with anaerobic MBR, and these uh, reactors were fed with phenol, uh, particularly chemical wastewater, coal gasification water, uh, have a lot of phenolic compounds, but are very difficult to treat with conventional anaerobic technologies. Uh, in his research, uh, he, uh, he showed that uh, now a USB reactor is much easier to disturb. What is plotted here is the time. You see uh, a phenol concentration of 500 milligram per liter, phenol concentration of 1000 milligram per liter. And uh, now the top part, uh, the, 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 the top dots is the removal by uh, the uh, MBR, the membrane, anaerobic membrane bioreactor. Um, then uh, the white one is the removal by the USB reactor. Uh, then the square black one is the effluent of the USB reactor. And the below white uh, dots is the effluent of the membrane bioreactor. Well, you see there's a quite a big difference in performance, what you can attain using an anaerobic MBR and a USB. So the USB was much less stable and a much higher stability was found by the anaerobic MBR. Now, what is, the, what is now the advantage of the anaerobic MBR? What is now the advantage of the anaerobic MBR if you apply it for chemical wastewaters? Well, chemical wastewaters, they consist of aromatics, phenols, catechols, erythrocinols, uh, et cetera. And you need specific bacteria to degrade uh, a specific compound. Um, uh, anaerobic bacteria, they have a very narrow substrate spectrum. Sometimes they, they, they convert only one compound to another, and another bacteria is required to, to convert that compound to, to mineralize it to, uh, to another compound. And that means, uh, um, yeah, you have to retain all the bacteria. Now, if you equip a bioreactor with a membrane, uh, with an ultrafiltration membrane, microfiltration is less and less used, but ultrafiltration is commonly used, then every, all the bacteria are retained. And then you, you, you ensure, in fact, that the bioactivity is being built up in the sludge bed that you are, in fact, developing. Now, with a USB reactor, that the biomass is prone to wash out. And you may lose the, uh, the specific bacteria that, that you need to have the degradation of these complex compounds. And that is also, uh, well, that is in fact uh, the trick of this because the activity of the sludge we measured, also the specific conversion rate of phenol, for instance, 
and it was much higher at specific activity than if you compare that with a UASB reactor. Um, our colleague from, from uh, Uruguay, Mangela, she is working on, uh, on, 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 the, uh, on the fouling control. Uh, of course, if you apply a membrane bioreactor, one of the problems that you have there is that the membrane gets blocked, that it gets uh, clogged and so on. So you need to clean the membrane. Now, that is the major energy input in these type of systems. So you would like to guarantee a high flux as long as possible. Now, one of the things that you can do is to scavenge the very small particles that clog the membrane and that scavenging that can be done with flux enhancers. Flux enhancers are um, uh, cationic polymers that bind the colloidal matter to form larger aggregates so that the fine, very fine particles that may clog the membranes are, don't exist anymore. And the very fine particles, they get grow into bigger particles now, these bigger particles, they, uh, the, the, the water flux is easy to pass through a cake layer with bigger particles than with the fine particles. Now, she is using all kind of online techniques to determine when these flux enhancers need to be added and how much they need to be added. And she's using uh, yeah, online flux measurement uh, techniques uh, to do that. And she's uh, also hard working on uh, the papers of her thesis. Uh, now, this work on, on anaerobic MBR, there are more topics that we have, some uh, couple of more PhD students working on that, but that is also a topic that we would like to proceed because the, we noticed that the chemical industries are quite interested in this topic, as well as the uh, companies like Biothane International, they are selling anaerobic MBRs to uh, industry, so uh, we, with them we cooperate to develop that uh, yeah, a little bit further. Um, now, methane can be generated from bio waste and biomass. In addition to methane, other products can be formed. And more and more, there's interest to, to, to produce other products. Uh, one thing is to produce uh, volatile fatty acids from, from waste sludge or from, 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 from organic waste components. And these volatile fatty acids they can be used to, pro to produce bioplastics. Now, at this very moment, we have a pilot plant in the Netherlands at demonstration level that is uh, acidly fermenting excess sewage sludge to extract the VFAs, the volatile fatty acids, to use these volatile fatty acids to produce, sorry, to produce polyhydroxyalkanoids. Now, at this moment, we have two PhD students working on this, Alexander Hendricks from the Netherlands and Pamela Saron from Ecuador, to, uh, to, to, to extract uh, products different from, from methane from, from the, uh, the bioreactors. This is, for instance, uh, the work done on the VFA production. Um, uh, what you see here is the bacterium uh, Placidophorans that is accumulating polyhydroxyalkanoates inside the cell. And of this bacterium that you see there, 80% uh, of the biomass dry weight may consist of polyhydroxyalkanoates. Now, why is, is this so important? Well, you can produce VFAs, but the concentration of VFA in the effluent will always be modest, not very high. And VFAs are very difficult to extract from the liquid. So how to harvest VFAs for the bioplastics? Downstream processing to separate VFA from water is unaffordable. So, the only thing that is affordable is to transfer these VFAs into an insoluble form. And the insoluble form is polyhydroxyalkanoates inside this bacterium. This is an aerobic bacterium. And how you can train this bacterium to produce so much polyhydroxyalkanoates? Well, what you do is that you have a cycle, you give them a, a high concentration of volatile fatty acids, and then a long period without feeding. Pulse feeding of volatile fatty acids. Now, these bacteria, they start to try to absorb as much as possible uh, VFAs, turn them into polyhydroxyalkanoates, so they can survive the very long period without feeding. And that is the trick. That is how you can turn VFAs into polyhydroxyalkanoates. The work of this gentleman, Alexander Hendricks, that was oriented 
to produce a specific, uh, a specific composition of VFAs in the bioreactor. Because the, the, the end user, the plastic producer, they would like to have a, 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 a typical um, uh, characteristic of the plastics. For instance, the, the, the stiffness of the plastics is dependent on the ratio of odd VFAs to even VFAs. Let's say valerate propionate ratio to butyrate acetate ratio. You cannot just use any VFA composition, but because th that gives a different quality of plastics. So you have to listen very carefully about what quality of bioplastic do you want. You want this ratio of VFAs, and then the, then the question is asked to us as a bioengineer, how do we, um, how do we manage a bioreactor in such a way that they produce the ratio of VFA that we want in the plastic? Now, he did quite some research, and for instance, uh, the research that he, he did uh, is with this uh, acidifying material. So you acidify sugars into VFAs, and with, uh, you also see he was able to grow them in granular uh, sludge. This is granular acidifying biomass, very convenient because then you don't need a membrane to retain the bacteria. It is simply settling and it's, uh, and it's retained. And he found that depending, so uh, he analyzed all cycles, and these are data of a year, eh? uh, because uh, he operated the reactor at a specific pH, and then he analyzed the cycle of production. And he found out that at a pH of 6, the composition of the VFA is completely different than at pH 5.3. So at, at pH 6, the P, uh, you produce more uh, uneven VFAs, then at the low pH, then you produce more even VFAs relatively. And that is important for the composition of the polyhydroxy alkanoates in your bioplastics later on. Now, this knowledge is also being used now in the demo reactor uh, of uh, the company Pax is doing that. Uh, then we have Pamela, she is working uh, on high pressure digestion. And uh, Pamela, she's coming from Ecuador, and she is particularly interested in steering the product formation using a high pressure digestion. What's a high pressure digestion? Well, this is a high pressure vessel. vessel. You feed it with, with organics. Uh, the organics are converted into methane and CO2. However, the solubility of CO2 is much higher than of methane. That means that the off gas of this digester consists merely of, of methane gas. And maybe the, in, the, in the headspace, it's 90, 95% of methane. And most of the CO2 is solubilized in a liquid. Now this CO2 is steering the fermentation pattern. And you may steer that also to a specific, uh, to a specific compound. In previous research, we were able to produce succinate in that extent. And succinate is a very crucial intermediate also for making bioplastics. Succinate is now being made by um, uh, pure cultures under very defined conditions. But this is a, a mixed reactor under non-sterile conditions. So if you can steer your bioreactor in such a way that you can use waste or wastewater making a specific product, it's way more cheaper and of interest for, for, for companies. Um, now, what she is doing, uh, now, first, uh, showing that indeed with CO2, you can steer the bioprocess. Uh, you can steer the biochemistry inside the system. For instance, here, going from one bar to, to, uh, uh, to five bar, um, uh, the conversion of propionate is, in fact, inhibited. So, and if you then can keep propionate, you can pre keep propionate for them to have a chain elongation, for instance, with alcohol to make a longer chain of, uh, of, of fatty acid. And then uh, she studied that for, for in this case, is uh, propionate and butyrate. And propionate is, for instance, much more sensitive for uh, accumulating uh, partial CO2 pressure, logically, because in the oxidation of propionate, there's also uh, uh, CO2 is being produced. Okay, but this is an example, and this is a research line that we also proceed. Um, now, talking about this anaerobic digestion and high pressure, you can also do other things with this. Uh, here you see a reactor that is started up uh, several hours. 
we see that the pH is more or less stable. Um, we added an alkaline uh, Wollastonite to absorb the accumulating CO2. But the pressure, you see the pressure is accumulated very quickly to, to 20 bars. Uh, 20 bars, uh, this is uh, quite a lot. Bacteria, they simply proceed, they, uh, they, they, they proceed. And uh, now here you see also uh, uh, pressure up to 100 bar we achieved and then we had to stop because the reactor is nearly to explode. So this uh, reactor guaranteed until 100 bars and then we have to stop. There's a safety valve, otherwise we have a bomb here. But uh, nice, nice, nice work. Now we are currently uh, thinking also to, uh, uh, you have the pressure build up with sodium acetate as feed and that goes up to, to 90 bar. At this moment, we are thinking maybe we can use this system. Eh? We can use this system. Uh, we have a project going on in India, in New Delhi. And uh, we were thinking maybe it is interesting to have this um, uh, in the basin of, of, of a building to have a pressure digester for your fecal matter. And then use the buildup pressure to, to lift the effluent and treat the effluent with hanging gardens. And the Indians, they love it. They love, uh, they would like to green the city, and Delhi is a concrete jungle. And then uh, if you then use the effluent of, of uh, an anaerobic reactor working at a high pressure, you have pressure. So you can also use a membrane. The, you, you already automatically create uh, transmembrane pressure, retrain pathogenic organisms inside the bioreactor, and direct the effluent which has nutrients, ammonium and phosphorus, add water, and then feed an ornamental vertical wetland or vertical garden with this. So uh, that could also maybe be interesting for uh, Sao Paulo, which is also a concrete jungle. Maybe we, <laughs> we, can, we, we can develop a joint project with Luana on this. Um, now, there's a novel uh, uh, technology that we're now are developing. Uh, and that is the uh, ammonium recovery from, from concentrated streams. Ammonium is not a finite resource. Ammonium is energy. Yeah, ammonium is being produced in the Harbour Bosch process, but nonetheless, ammonium is a valuable resource because it costs energy to make ammonium. So we have some uh, research being done. We have three PhDs now working on this, and we just submitted two other projects to recover ammonium from sludge re reject waters and to produce energy from ammonium. So ammonium is an energy carrier and solid oxal fuel cell or to uh, yeah, recover ammonium for ammonium stripping. And in the meantime, we are also studying the impact of uh, uh, carbohydrate fermentation on proteins. What we observed and that was in fact, that was a comment that the company Biotain made to us. If we have uh, organic waste and we have both proteins and carbohydrates, we see that the protein conversion is retarded as long as we have carbohydrates. Now that is a topic that uh, uh, Zedeng from China, or she named herself also Sophie, easier for us to pronounce. Um, she is studying how this effect, this inhibition works of carbohydrates on protein conversion. But okay, I don't have results that uh, she is uh, Still work on this, but maybe in, uh, next time. But I do have some results of uh, the former students. This is Niels van Linden. Uh, he is, is in stu studying the alternative um, conversion of ammonium. Now, ammonium, uh, the ammonium cycle is known to you. It is in proteins. It is excreted by humans. Uh, then it goes to the wastewater treatment plant, where you first have to oxidize the ammonium to nitrate, nitrite. And then you have to um, uh, reduce it again to nitrogen gas using BOD. Now that is, that is the common cycle. If you have a, a sludge digester, then the reject water of the dewatering, uh, dewatering sludge has a high concentration of ammonium. In the 90s, uh, the Anamox system is developed for that. And Anamox is in fact uh, yeah, partial oxidation of ammonium to nitrite and using nitrite with ammonium together to convert uh, to, to nitrogen gas. Now, with Niels, we're doing something else. We have a physical chemical technique in which ammonium is in fact recovered as such, 
and the energy content of ammonium is used to produce electricity. So, and uh, we think that is a competitive technology for, for, for Anamox. And uh, what we use then is a fuel cell in which the uh, recovered ammonium is generated to, uh, to electricity. And to a little bit more in detail, so ammonium now is merrily destructed in nitrification, denitrification that costs about 40 to 50 megajoule per kilogram N. Anamox is way more cheaper and that costs you 16 to 18 megajoule per kilogram N. But the theoretical available energy content in ammonium is 21 megajoule per kilogram N. So uh, with, with, with nitrification, denitrification, you destruct this uh, energy, but also with Anamox, you destruct this energy in a way more cheaper uh, um, uh, fashion, of course. Haber-Bosch was developed in, in, in 1900 to produce, uh, uh, to produce ammonium from nitrogen gas via electrolysis. So the protons that were needed to reduce nitrogen gas from the atmosphere to ammonium, they were derived from water using electrolysis. That's why uh, the energy is about 100, 110 megajoule per kilogram. Currently, the protons come from cracking methane, and that is way more energy less intensive. That costs you about 25 to 35 megajoule per kilogram N to produce ammonium. And the energy content then later on of ammonium is 21 megajoule per kilogram N. Um, now, in the Netherlands, uh, we use directly ammonium in manure, sometimes we strip it and then we uh, wash it with sulfuric acid, so we get ammonium uh, sulfate. Um, but these compounds, are, yeah, you, it's difficult to, to sell them on the market. Uh, you can also use directly a fertile irrigation, the ammonium. So there was a gap uh, and the industry was interested to make a more useful product from ammonium. Now, and that is what we try to do in, in this project that is now um, running and uh, which is following up with other projects. It's N to kilowatt hour and nitrogen to kilowatt hour. Now, what we then do, we have a sludge reject water or you have urine, you have a pretreatment, and then we concentrate ammonium. We recover the ammonium and then we use the ammonium in a solid oxide fuel cell. This is a high temperature fuel cell in which the ammonium is cracked into hydrogen gas and nitrogen gas. Nitrogen gas is going through the atmosphere and the hydrogen uh, is oxidized to water and the energy that comes free as electricity, it's one and to, and to thermal energy at 700 degrees Celsius. So it is useful thermal energy. Now, uh, in the various research line, this was further researched. And uh, now, uh, in, in, in brief, uh, this 21 megajoule per kilogram ammonium that gives you, in theory, 5.8 kilowatt hours. Now, not all the ammonium can be converted to electricity. A fuel cell has about an efficiency of 50 to 55 percent. So you can make 11, 12, 13, 14, depends on the efficiency, uh, megajoule of electricity and the rest is turned into thermal energy. Uh, now, there's some research is going on also on the fuel cell technique, because if we have H2S there, if we have chloride there, if we have, uh, yeah, they, that will impact the, uh, uh, the reformer where the ammonium is reformed to uh, hydrogen gas and nitrogen gas. So there are some, uh, some follow-up work to be done still. Now, how do we do that? We use electrolysis. Uh, not sorry, not electrolysis, electrodialysis. Uh, we use that, and uh, what you, what you see here uh, is an electrodialysis cell, which is also equipped with a bipolar membrane cell. Uh, what is a bipolar membrane? Well, in a bipolar membrane, we have on one side we have an anode, and on the other side we have a cathode. Uh, so the positive ions they go to the cathode, and then the uh, negative ions they go to the anode. The water is then split also in a, in, 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 in a proton and in a hydroxyl. Now, the ammonium, uh, if the ammonium comes together with the hydroxyl, we get a high pH ammonium water. Then we, in fact, we make Na3, ammonia gas. And this ammonia gas that can then be extracted as a product. It can be put into a fuel cell 
or it can be also sold in the market as ammonium water. Now at the acid side, the bicarbonate comes. Together with the protons, we produce CO2. So hey, from the, the weight, hey, the main is ammonium bicarbonate, which is in Schwarz reject water, is turned into NH3 gas and into CO2 gas. Now we, uh, we, in fact, we as a group, we patented technology and now there's a spin-off company working with this and uh, we hoped uh, with some follow-up projects to, uh, yeah, to turn this into a feasible project, uh, in a feasible product. And we would like to demonstrate that at the real wastewater site in, in, in Amsterdam and in another city of, of Venlo. So the energy con uh, consumption eh, to, to concentrate the ammonium is only seven to mega, nine megajoule, but to split water, of course, that costs more energy. So we are a little bit more expensive in energy than the, uh, than the Anamox, but we make a product. And in Anamox, you destruct uh, the, the ammonium as such. Okay, that was the ammonium story. Keep your questions, sir. don't forget your questions. Write them all down, otherwise uh, it would be a pity if you lose them. We're nearly there, a few slides more. Some low-tech technologies, we're working quite in, also in developing countries. We have some projects in Bangladesh and in India, in Kenya, Mozambique. Uh, now here are two PhD students, Joya Ryungu from Kenya and Antona Piaggio. She's also from Uruguay, but she's doing a project in, uh, for India. Her project of Antonella is uh, to work with membrane bioreactors, but don't work with the membranes since they are in those conditions are difficult to operate, but to couple a flotation unit to a CSTR and the flotation unit has then the function of a membrane. Now she's researching whether this, uh, whether, whether this combination can work and whether there's no negative impact of possible oxygen to the anaerobic digester. Joy Ryungo, is doing other type of research. Joy is, uh, in fact, she is co-digesting uh, fecal matter from, uh, from the slum of Kibera. That's the biggest slum in, of uh, Nairobi in Kenya. And she is digesting this fecal matter together with market waste. So she tried all kinds of ratios of market waste with fecal matter. And uh, why, why this combination? Well, if you digest, if you co-digest with, uh, with market waste, then the organic fraction of the market waste will be converted into acids. And these acids, if the pH drops, they turn into non-dissociated acids. And these non-dissociated acids, these are toxic for bacteria, also for methanogens, so it should not be too high, but also for pathogens. And that is exactly what she was researching. The die-off of pathogens, and she took two types of pathogens, uh, the E. coli and ascaric eggs, so the helminth eggs, of uh, an E. coli. And eggs are very, very um, uh, yeah, persistent. Eh? They, these are very hard and difficult to degrade. But uh, what she, she saw, she saw uh, yeah, quite some lock removals uh, when the concentration of, of non dissociated fatty acids accumulate. And uh, yeah, the locks that she could attain, uh, yeah, the normal. Uh, uh, yeah, locks yeah, for eight is quite high, but in a couple of days, uh, yeah, she could remove, in fact, to below detection level, uh, the, the, the pathogens. Now, she has some pilot plants in, uh, in, in Kenya. Uh, she's defending her PhD thesis the 28th of January next year, so she's very happy. And uh, she's already in kind of a spin-off company to, uh, to, to work. Um, uh, the company is called Synergy, to work in the slums of Kibera. We stay uh, in Africa. Uh, this is uh, two projects uh, for Noah Gallimus and uh, Selma Nikis. I have some uh, results of Selma. Uh, reuse of water for agricultural production. It's a hot topic in various countries and everybody is scared about pathogenic contamination. Um, in previous work that I did in the past in, in, in Ghana, we, we found that um, the source water can be contaminated, but sometimes the products in the market are contaminated even though they are irrigated with fresh water. Now, we found it out, but we never did actual research on that. Now, that is what Selma is doing, and these are some results of her. Um, uh, this lady is Selma, by the way. 
this is her uh, uh, research uh, plotted here are uh, four different types of water and the log coli that is associated with this water the first water is groundwater and it's apparently this groundwater is near there was near a pond system is contaminated because there are 10 to the third coli there the second is water which is mixing water this is blended surface water with wastewater has a higher concentration of E. coli, 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 of E. coli. Then there was a groundwater B, was also near the pond system. It's the same as the other groundwater. And we have uh, wastewater. This is water that overflows the pond system. And that has also a concentration of 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 of E. coli. Now, she follows the products, the produce that were grown in the field to the marketplace. And, uh, and, she, she, and she bought the products and she washed these products to measure the pathogens that were contaminated the products. And very strangely, irrespective of the source water that was used, a similar contamination was found. Now, then she analyzed the way how these produce was handled. Now, and then she see, okay, when it arrives to the market, uh, all products are washed by the lady that is selling these products on the market and the washing water is as contaminated as you can think of. All the products are washed in the same water. There is a limited capacity for fresh water. Now, and then, so this whole discussion that is going on, okay, we need to first install treatment systems to make clean water and then we can reuse water. So, yeah, okay, but if the, if the, if the line <laughs> of the products is not taken care about, then it doesn't matter what type of water you use because uh, you should take care about your 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 ent entire um, uh, line okay this is food for discussion also on a political level i can tell you now then i finally close off with the research line that um, i'm partly involved uh, when it concerns into digestion of granular sludge but uh, uh, particularly Merle de Kreuk is involved, my colleague Merle de Kreuk, she's a professor in our group as well. And also Mark van Loosrecht is involved and he's professor at the Faculty of Applied Sciences. Um, there are two PhD projects in our group working on uh, granular sludge. Uh, one is studying the fate of suspended solids and the other one is more into the granular diffusion kinetics. This is, by the way, Merle de Kreuk. Uh, now, the difference between uh, Nereda aerobic granular sludge and an activated sludge, simply we Nereda, we make granules. The conditions in the, in the Nereda reactor, in the, uh, in the granular reactor, they select for the bacteria that granulate. So if you apply the proper conditions, you will automatically get granules. And there are some tricks in the granulation. And I have to say, not everybody understands well the tricks. One is uh, that you, uh, you have to this uptake of BUD during the anaerobic phase of the, uh, of the aerobic granular uh, reactor. This, this is important because the poly of the, the, these, these POWs and uh, the phosphate accumulant organisms under um, high food conditions, they, they, they form, in fact, polyhydroxy acanoates. And they liberalize phosphate. Uh, this is the, the traditional bio P removal. So they absorb the BUD. And that is, in fact, this, uh, the, the, you, you select, in fact, for the slow growing aerobic organisms. This is an aerobic reactor, but you start with an anaerobic phase. And by doing that, you select for slow growing organisms. And these organisms, they form the core of the aerobic granule and if you do that then you get granular sludge now that has been unraveled already in the past decades eh, these first things and uh, now the work that uh, Merle is now focusing on is also the uh, the selective was wasting of excess sludge because uh, a, a Nereda type of, of, uh, of treatment system they don't have primary clarifiers and they don't have secondary clarifiers so uh, all the primary sludge goes there. But if you, uh, with the way that you operate the system, you can selectively retain the granules and get rid of the waste sludge. Now that is the way also how to operate the things. And uh, yeah, to apply the selection at each cycle of the sludge. 
Now, what is now she's doing? These are the two PhD students at this moment. Uh, she's doing in situ imaging of the granule structure and the possible structural changes and variations. And uh, Stara, she's using uh, 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 MRI um, uh, magnetic resonance uh, to uh, like uh, so echo uh, echo systems to to study uh, the the morphology of the sludge and to see uh, how this structurally is changing when suspended solids are submitted to uh, to granules. Diffusion mapping, NMR is used, uh, nuclear magnetic resonance is used to follow, um, in fact, the different uh, compounds in, inside the granules. And uh, the other PhD, Leno van den Berg, he is more modeling uh, all these bioprocesses, which are linked to the kinetic constants that you actually measure in situ in the granules. And they change depending on the granule structure. Now that is uh, the actual work what is done. Now also, uh, yeah, aerobic granule sludge. This is still a topic that is uh, not completely unraveled. And uh, yeah, surely we will develop also some some further work and maybe also together with Luana in future on this type of topics. Now this gives a brief overview. I know this already I talked too much. I'm very sorry for that. I still hope you have the questions uh, ready. But I'm I'm happy to answer uh, any questions from from your side. So thank you, Jules. Uh, you you have a picture of the group, right? Yes. Uh, <laughs> let me. Yeah, I know this is a little bit old picture. Not everybody is there, but Mela is there, and some former PhD students are there. I see. Oh, there's not not everybody's there. Steve is there. So uh, thank you so much. It was okay. a really nice presentation. It's really interesting because we can see that you cover, for example, in the anaerobic MBR, I would say, what about the following? And then you come with another research about the following. So it's really interesting how in, in there, and I know like every, you're working there, how you put in line all the research. And it was really nice that you mentioned about like checking what the society and the market want, and then we, we check yep. like our research. Um, also, like in the first part, you show it about education, that you indeed had the courses already. So you, you were like ahead, even if you we didn't have the, the crisis in our sanitation, like with the coronavirus. So you, you had already that. So it's really nice to see how you are managing all these problems. Um, we have already two questions in the chat. One is from Cesar Marin. Uh, when you were showing like the cascade reactor with their sludge, he asked like if, is there any research ongoing on the methods to extract those poly polymers from the sludge? Um, yeah, and that is the extraction. I think the polymers, particularly these alginate-like polymers of uh, aerobic granule sludge. Yes, this extraction has been developed. This is kind of a downstream processing. And um, I can put it in the chat, the name of, if you, if you Google this name, let me see, Comera. That is the name that you have to Google. And then you find also me let's see i will check it immediately yeah and then you check you have the english button and then you see also uh, uh you know, the company uh, that is uh, in fact extracting the polymers to make the product camera from the excess sludge so the extraction method is there okay in jose gustavo he asked, uh, are there any ongoing projects um, in the area of methane dissolved in effluents from anaerobic reactors? Yeah, that's a good point. And I noticed in Brazil is very important because uh, it is very much linked to anaerobic sewage treatment. And why is that? Well, the, the solubility of methane is not high. It's something like 20 to 30 milliliter per liter uh, at a given uh, partial pressures. And, um, but um, if you have a very dilute wastewaters and so high flows, 
there will be quite a substantial amount of methane that is being produced, solubilized in the effluent, particularly if the concentration of the wastewater is low, eh? let's say 500, 600 milligram per liter. Now that is sewage. So direct sewage treatment, maybe 30, 40% of the methane that you produce is solubilized in the effluent. However, in the Netherlands, we don't have uh, municipal sewage treatment. And why is that? Well, in the winter, the temperature drops to below 10 degrees Celsius and uh, anaerobic treatment will, will, not, will not function. Uh, trials will be done in the past, and, but yeah, low temperatures is, is no way that you can have an active uh, anaerobic reactor. Moreover, in the Netherlands, all regulations are targeted to very stringent NMP removal. And if you then remove all the organic matter anaerobically, you don't have BOD left for conventional NMP removal. So uh, for these reasons, anaerobic municipal sewage treatment is not applied in the Netherlands. And thus, the research question of solubilized methane in anaerobic effluents, it's not a research question which is of direct interest for the water authorities in the Netherlands, nor for the companies involved. So yeah, we can do research ourselves, but uh, yeah, who pays? <laughs> I see. And about the, the water reuse that is showing the Mozambique, this is really interesting because here in Brazil, sometimes we talk about that. So this research is really important because then you say, okay, whenever you say, let's reuse the water or the, the treated wastewater and people say, no, but what about the E. coli and these pathogens? And then you say, okay, but the, the water that you are already using, it's not that. So sometimes it's really interesting. So I think, and you said that um, this research is, is going on, right? Yeah, this is research is going on. Uh, but in it, I did in the past, I had several projects in Palestine and in Jordan and in Egypt, uh, where, we had, where we had projects together with agronomists. And uh, I, I learned a lot from them because I have a complete different look now to uh, effluent reuse. Um, well, in Jordan also they apply restricted irrigation in that sense, uh, that so you can tolerate higher uh, uh, pathogen levels. Um, now, if you have to, but you have to include the entire chain. And um, what we learn now in Mozambique that you need a multiple barrier. Uh, making a very good treatment uh, plant, removing all pathogens does not guarantee that the product is not contaminated. That is not, the, that is not the sole guarantee. Moreover, what we observed in, in, in Africa uh, cities and also in Mozambique, that at the end of a treatment plant, they always have a chlorination step. And if you realize that in United States, in, in Israel, in Australia, and in the southern part of Europe, where they apply effluent reuse, chlorination is, is forbidden as a final product. Because if a treatment plant does not remove all organics, and if soon, if you add chlorine or, or chlorate or uh, chlorine gas, you form carcinogenic organochlorides. And these carcinogenic organochlorides, they accumulate in the field because they are persistent. They, they will not be degraded and they bioaccumulate in the crops. So for that reason, uh, like in the southern part of the United States, but also in Spain, uh, membrane bioreactors are used, but no chlorination. And everywhere in Africa that have visited a treatment plant, they, at the end, they have a chlorination, irrespective of the fact that the treatment plant is not working properly. So there are a lot of organics that are simply oxidized by, by, by chlor <laughs> and formed into organic chlorides, which yeah, I think is, uh, yeah, the disinfection byproducts is, is, is underestimated when effluent is reused. I, I, for me, I don't like this chlorine, this, uh, yeah, indeed. And here in Brazil, for example, the law for water, actually, we do need the, the chloride. So that's maybe it's a cultural aspect, too, because um, yeah, but it's also we say like it, this is a clean water because we have chloride. Like, yeah, it's clean water, but it has organochloride. Yeah, so indeed. it has compounds. It has chemical compounds which are carcinogenic. Yeah. And this is often awareness that is lacking because everybody is looking only to pathogens. Of course, we should we should look pathogens, but <laughs> yeah, there's more pathogens for sure. Okay, and the uh, I will, I would mention that it's missing in the list Brazil, so let's work on that. <laughs> like <laughs> I saw many countries, but 
We need to yeah, include yeah, Brazil. I have a Brazilian PhD at this moment. Uh, yeah. And that is, in the past I had, but uh, unfortunately, uh, the funds of Brazil, they dropped down. <laughs> yeah, indeed. I think Beatriz is here in the chat. She yeah, is, okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. Be Beatrice is now now Be is trying to get uh, a fund to uh, to come uh, to come again to Delft. Yeah, nice. And uh, about the the last one about Nereda, if you could tell more, like what you, the next steps that from that those studies, and then we can uh, what, finish. Yeah. Yeah. What what we what it will be done in Nereda is. Uh, um, the the way to guarantee granulation because not always the granulation is performing in the same way so do you have insight in the relation into the um, the composition the actual composition of the influence and its impact on the granule formation process um, that is being done the fate of uh, suspended solids because there's no primary clarifier primary uh, so they have a certain fate in the granules, do they disturb the granulation and to what extent that is being done? With respect to nutrients, uh, uh, sometimes you see a tailing of phosphorus that there's too high concentration as phosphorus is coming out. It's not completely understood what is happening here. There is now some, you know, some current research is being done also to do that, but it's not, the, uh, it's not yet unraveled completely. So the relation about efficient nutrient removal in granular sludge, because you have to consider that in the Netherlands, the uh, restrictions are going down. At this moment, effluents have to limit to 10 milligram N and one milligram P. That is the old standards. The new standards are five milligram P, five milligram N and 0.35 milligram P. And the newest standards will be 2.2 milligram N and 0.1 milligram P. Now, so you can, uh, there will be more and more, uh, yeah, a pressure on the biosystems to meet it. And everything that cannot be done by biology, yeah, has to be done physical chemically in one way or another. But the more you can do biology uh, with the biology, the cheaper it will be. So that will be a continuous challenge to, uh, yeah, have extensive N and P removal uh, with uh, with this granular system. I see. So then you have this also, let's say, post treatment for Nereda whenever the restrictions are. Yes, lower yes. Lower. And that is sometimes is applied and sometimes it's simply solved by adding chemicals and then a sand filtration and then you. you uh, but that is not the most clever. Uh, but OK, but indeed. OK, so I think we don't have any more questions in the chat, but thank you so much, Jules, for the time. I think it was really, really nice to see all those uh, research and uh, we see that like things are improving and you have <laughs> this, um, you, you see like in the future what, what can be done. So it's really interesting to listen to you always. So thank you so much. And thank you everyone in the, in the chat for being here. So, see you. Okay. Uh, thank you for your kind words. And I hope uh, we'll meet in uh, next year again, of course. But I hope then in, uh, in Bebo <laughs> and that we don't have to use the screens the entire year anymore. Yeah, for sure. And uh, hopefully we can proceed with our joint workshop in November. Let's yeah. hope for the best. That would and be great. Face-to-face -face workshop. <laughs> and face-to-face. -face and okay. have a drink together. Yeah, okay. okay. See Wishing you. you all nice Merry Christmas and uh, Happy New Year. And for you too. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.